Happy Saturday, everybody. Hoping to see somebody catch up here. I'm showing zero viewers at the moment, but that can't be right. I see chats coming in in real time. There we go. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, for those who've been following the weather situation here, um, it has gone from 107 to 96 and raining. And the only thing worse than 107 is raining at 96 Fahrenheit. That's a, that's a pretty miserable existence. So it's air you can wear. Uh, let's see. Nobody has any questions yet. That's okay. Austin was 110 today. Yeah. Although there's a bit of a respite coming. Well, it looks like we're going to have another surge. Looking at the, the long-term forecast data, probably another 10 to 12-day surge in about four days. And then we should see it finally start to cool off measure, uh, measurably. So better than, the, uh, better than the alternative. We don't tend to have just a ton of fall here. We have summer, we have about 10 minutes of nice fall weather, and then it's like 40 degrees. So I see all the hellos. Good evening, Wendy and Gary and Zenuite and uh, Tiata Sturgeon from Western PA. One of the librarians at my institution that I work for is from Lancaster, PA. Not sure where that is in relation to Western PA, but uh, she's from Lancaster. Uh, Saul, Mar um, Marion, Amy, Diane Tipton, Abigail from upstate New York. Uh, Zeno, I hope it cools soon. People are grumpy. People are grumpy. Alice Daisy, good evening from Seattle. From the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, rural South Dakota lawyer, good evening. Um, I didn't, my, my, the last 30 minutes has been just an absolute circus, but uh, I had planned to put, and I did not get it done in time, but I had planned to put in this, uh, the description of this video, the Amazon wish list. Somebody had asked during the, the uh, chat last night uh, if I could put together an Amazon wish list. Um, and so I said, sure, what the heck? So I'll put together an Amazon wish list, all, and uh, everything on that wish list will go to um, improve my studio, improve my audio video, which ultimately improves the viewer experience for you all. Uh, and so does any help that uh, that you feel um, you want to give through uh, super chat, super stickers, anything like that. Um, you know, YouTube does keep thirty percent of that as their fee, which is not unreasonable. I certainly don't uh, object to that. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you if you if you so feel inclined and want to want to support the channel, we've got a couple of ways to do that. Please do not ever feel obligated um, to spend money on the channel. This is something that I do. Um, I enjoy doing it. Um, I'm getting better at it. I know I'm not great at it, but I'm getting better. And, uh, you know, one day, hopefully, I'll be able to, to use it as another means to help support my family. Uh, but right now, I have a job that that, that pays me a, a, a living wage. I have a place to live, so it could certainly be much worse. And I'm, I'm not ungrateful um, for a moment about my about my circumstance. But if you still feel inclined to help, I certainly um, appreciate that. Southwest Missouri, Chilliwack, B.C., I have a lot of folks, Grace and Faith for All, who are from BC. I need to get up uh, to BC. I've never been to BC, but I should go. Um, I've never met I've never met an unhappy Canadian, so I assume that's probably true for the uh, fine folks of uh, British Columbia. So I need to get up to uh, to BC and and uh, say hi to you guys from Southwest Missouri. Okay. Got some good lakes up in Southwest Missouri. Niagara Falls, Canada, on the Canadian side of the falls. I've flown to Niagara Falls. Um, to that area on both sides of the of the line, both to the U.S. side and to uh, the Canadian side. Watched you earlier today, says Gary. Yeah, Aaron and I had a good talk. Um, Diana Tipton, I want to grab this question before it leaves the screen. Does Leah have a real chance with the lawsuit? I hope she does. Yeah, I think she does. Um, Leah has the financial resources and the ability to surround herself with people who are experts. Um, that the average Joe, because of her success, and it's not 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 in a bad way, um, she has access to 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 um, some of the finest lawyers in the country, and they certainly would not put their name on any pleading that they didn't legitimately believe they had a fantastic opportunity uh, to win. So. Yeah, I think she does have a, a real chance down it. Yeah. So for those of you who may be new to the chat, 
Um, if you haven't already, go and like um, the chat, subscribe to the channel. It does help the algorithm. Um, uh, throw a chat up in the box, even if it's just hi, that also helps the al algorithm as well. Hello from Montreal. Uh, one of my colleagues has a, a uh, his spouse is French Canadian originally. She's now, of course, a U.S. citizen, but uh, but she's a she's a French Canadian by birth. Um, so uh, yeah, if you haven't already, um, like uh, like and subscribe. Um, hit the notification bell so you'll be notified every time I go live. Like on Monday, I did a pop up live. Um, my Fridays are fairly scheduled. This one I planned earlier today, so it wasn't quite pop up, but uh, but close. Uh, Denise, I see that question. Um, and Zenu, I'll grab that in just a second. Uh, let's see. Let's start with Zenuite. Oh, so if you have a question that you absolutely guarantee you want an answer to, um, uh, send it as a super chat. I'll put it on the screen. I'll make sure I answer it. Um, right now, I'm able to keep up with the chat, but uh, like last night, the chat got about 15 minutes ahead of me. So let's grab this first. As a lawyer, what do you look for in an assistant? Do they need to be legal, like a paralegal or legal assistant? Um, so it depends on the position. If I'm hiring for a legal assistant, then... Uh, um, if I'm hiring for a legal assistant, then of course they need to have some, or as paralegal rather, they need to have some experience. And paralegal is actually a, a credential; it's a certification, actually. So um, I need them to have that. But uh, if if I'm hiring a, a legal assistant with no experience in the industry, um, I'm certainly able and willing to train those folks. There's no reason I, I can't. Um, the big thing is they need to be able to handle um, high volume. If I give them a, if I give them ten assignments, they need to prioritize, and part of that is on me telling them the order they need to do it in. Um, but also, um, if I, I need to, they need to know when to ask questions and when I expect them to handle the work um, on their own. Um, and really, we, it's it's a it's a cross accountability thing. We hold each other uh, accountable. So she makes sure that everything gets docketed and calendared correctly and gets me the documents I need to do my job. And then my job is to get her uh, documents. And, and most of my day-to-day -day communication with clients is handled through paralegals. That, you know, I, They'll draft a letter, I'll add to it and sign it. I draft a pleading, they spell check, proofread, you know, and then they do all the filing and they email clients and they send letters to clients and things. So um, you know, I'm the frontline communication, the front line of communication, but most of the communicating is actually done um, by the paralegals, the legal assistant. So, the, the, you know, um, they don't have to be a licensed or certified paralegal. They could be a legal assistant. The pay is generally a little different just because they don't have their credentials, but they can always go back at some point in the future uh, and secure the credentials. But if it's if you like working in a fast paced environment, um, you know, uh, providing uh, litigation support or, or uh, legal support to folks, uh, to lawyers is always uh, a great career, in my opinion. Um, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Gary Mackey says, says it right, guys. Um, you heard it last night. No politics. All right. This is not a place I want for uh, divisiveness and consternation. I want this to be a place where we come together, hang out, and uh, learn uh, together. So uh, thanks, Gary, for uh, getting my back there. Appreciate that. Let's see. Denise Lockler says, how did I meet a, a. Ron? Great question, Denise. So I started watching his channel last summer, summer of 2022. And um, he put out sort of an all call like, hey, it was uh, uh, Danny Masters is getting ready to go on trial um, in the criminal case. The, the first the first trial was in, uh, I think, started in November, which was like about three or four months, three or four weeks. Right at the end of October into November, they deliberated through Thanksgiving. The jury did. And he said, I got a lot of questions about this process. I don't know how it works. And so I reached out to him through his YouTube channel and um, was sort of a uh, off the record source. I verified information. I talked to him about po about the procedure, about the law, how it works. And then once we established a relationship and, and uh, we both realized that we had a, a common goal um, and that we were both good people and neither one of us was, was a shyster, um, and we were just trying to make the world a better place. Then I agreed to go on the record with him and became a legal contributor to his channel. And then at his request and the request of many of his followers, which you know many of you are should be as well, um, I was asked to, uh, hey, uh, start a YouTube channel. I'm sure we got folks out there who'd listen to you. So I did, and here we are. So that's how Aaron and I, uh, how I got hooked up with Aaron. All right. Uh, did I follow the Ma Marty Rathbun case? Where they got paid off and dropped. So first off, they did not get paid off. Um, they took a settlement. Being paid off is different than taking a settlement. Being paid off is um, extortion or bribery. That is a felony. Taking a, a legal settlement that has documents that make it enforceable is not being paid off. I'm not terribly from. I know enough about Marty Rathbun um, to not talk about Marty Rathbun. Not that I'm. Not that I have any issues with it. I just don't know enough about it. Um, I am familiar with his case, but I don't know the details of it. 
Um, she also has the, she, you, you also think she has the money um, to take it to the end. So here's the thing. In this case, um, as a plaintiff, she doesn't have to have the money. The lawyers have taken it on what's called a contingency fee. The lawyers don't get paid if Leah doesn't get paid. It's the classic, have you been hurt in a car wreck? Call us and you don't get a dime if we don't win. It's, it's just a standard contingency fee agreement. It's super, it's super common. Probably half to two thirds of legal cases in the United States are covered by a contingency fee agreement of some sort. Okay, so she doesn't, it is helpful to have the money because now, you know, they can hire the expert to do some of that kind of thing. But um, if that's what you mean. Now, you may also be referring to the fact that she has enough uh, independent wealth that she doesn't need the settlement money that in, that Scientology will inevitably um, uh, pony up. Northwest Arkansas, yeah. Um, flown into Springdale, flown into Rogers. Um, uh, my spouse's uh, family used to live in Northwest Arkansas, still has some family up in that area. Uh, and the, the program manager, sort of our head, the head honcho, on the day-to-day -day operations side of my department is a Northwest Arkansas native before uh, she relocated here. Uh, hi from Texas, from Kerry Rogers. Thanks for coming to Aaron's channel earlier and answered some questions there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's. Uh, I'll try to help you out there. St. Catharines, Ontario. Hello from Wisconsin. 98 Wednesday, 72 yesterday. It probably won't. I mean, at night, it might hit high 70s here. It probably will not um, maintain in the 70s um, for more than about three or four hours, and maybe six hours a day. So throughout the greater part of the day, it won't stay in the 70s until probably early to mid-October. We really don't have much fall. It's a really long, hot summer. We get about three days. I jokingly say we have about 10 minutes. We have about three or four days, maybe a week, and then we're into early winter. So. Abigail says, how long do you think it'll take before Leah's trial actually, or case actually goes to trial? Probably three to four years. It might be faster, maybe 18 months or two years if we're lucky. I think realistically, just because of the amount of discovery and the amount of, um, uh, the, the number of depositions, the amount of discovery, and the, the number of issues that are likely to go to the court for uh, determination, procedural and substantive issues, probably three to four years. Um, I just, I'm, I'm anticipating a trial date of 2026, 2027. You know, late 2026, early 2027. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's earlier, but uh, from everything I can tell, that that seems to be um, what uh, a reasonable expectation. Taters, Hamilton, Ontario. One of my favorite shows is the uh, Canadian sketch comedy on Hulu called Letter Kenny with Jared Kiso. So I'm a big Jared Kiso guy. Uh, I know it's crass, and I know it probably doesn't represent uh, Canada. It sort of plays on Canadian stereotypes, but uh, I find it I find it humorous nonetheless. Sydney, Australia. Subscribe. Thanks. Yeah, guys, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you like and subscribe below. Question. Why can't the attorneys representing the church be served instead of the defendants identified in the lawsuit? Because the attorneys are not the defendants. Just because I represent a defendant doesn't mean I get served. Um, I don't have a better answer other than that's what the law says. The law does not allow an attorney to be served in lieu of their client. The law requires the actual party to the case, the defendant, be served. That's what the law provides. I know it's not the greatest answer you're ever going to hear, but that's the reality of it. The law does not allow attorneys does not allow attorneys to receive service. Now, once an attorney officially enters their appearance, now we all we can all know who's representing somebody, but until they file papers with the court that says I represent this person or this entity, they cannot receive pleadings or service of, of legal documents on behalf of their client. So. Uh, so the simple, the, the simple, best, and most accurate, probably least sexy answer is the law just simply doesn't allow it, Peter. South Texas, Turleyite. Is there a site or some way to check an attorney's win losses? No. Um, I mean, you can see every case that they have entered their appearance on. You can see every case that's gone to trial within reason. There's, you know, if it was a, a protected matter of guardianship or a a uh, mental health court or a uh, deprived or certain cases involving minors uh, where minors are parties to the case, not necessarily victims, but parties to the case. Um, those are often sealed. Those often aren't public record. But uh, no, there's no way to know conclusively. I mean, if you think about it, even as a baby lawyer, I've been practicing six months or a year. I had a caseload of 70 cases. 
when I was a full-time lawyer, I would routinely have 70 to 112 cases on my 112, 115 cases on my docket at any one time, realistically. So, uh, no, there's no way to know. It's not like a baseball team or a basketball team where you can look up the official stats in the uh, in the record books. No, there's no way to know. Frank Ferrante says, hi, my name is Frank. Well, good evening, Frank. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Finding a non shysty lawyer is tough. Knuckles, I hate that you feel that way. The vast majority of lawyers that I know are stand-up people. They are great advocates. They are dedicated to their craft and to the representation of their clients. So it um, sounds like you haven't had um, good experiences with attorneys uh, in, in at least the recent past, and I hate that for you. Um, I feel terrible that, that that that's your experience, but in my experience, that's more the exception than the rule. So if you're looking for somebody, I hope you can find them. If I want to loan someone money and write up an agreement with the terms of the loan and they sign it, does that make it a binding contract? Uh, theoretically, I will say this because um, I'm seeing some folks in the chat for the first time. Any anything, any question I answer here should not be construed as legal advice. Um, unless you have signed a retainer agreement with my firm and me, um, and you would know if you had, and then you've paid me money as a retainer or something, I don't represent you and I'm not giving you legal advice. Um, but if I want to loan someone money and write up an agreement with terms of the loan and they sign somebody a binding contract, well, possibly, but you would be subject to the truth and lending provisions of the Uniform Commercial Code, um, specifically if it's involving the sales of goods, um, particularly Article 2 and 2A. Um, you would also be subject to other types of uh, truth and lending laws at the state and federal level as well. Um, so it's hard to know for sure. To have a contract, you need an offer, you need an acceptance, you need consideration, which is defined as le is legally defined as the bargain for exchange. So it doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, offer, acceptance, consideration, and then performance. And then if you need to seek a remedy, you also have to prove uh, breach that the contract was in some materially way, material way breached. So hard to know for sure. I know you can't guess, but if I must ask you to guess, what value settlement do you, I have no idea. I, I have absolutely no context with which to answer that question, Stephen. Um, and I, I don't feel comfortable guessing at that. As soon as I say a million dollars, it becomes 700 million. As soon as I say 700 million, the case gets dismissed. I have no way to um, intelligently answer that question, sorry. Good day from Melbourne, says Reefer Ricky. From Mexico City, very interested in your input to understand your law in regards to uh, lawsuits. Um, Anna or Anna from 843, I see your question, that's the one I'm reading. Um, I'm going to need more information to, to answer that. Um, what exactly are you wanting to know about our laws as it pertains to that here? Um, it's I mean, we're talking, you know, 100,000 pages of, of statutes, case law. So I, I'm going to need a little more. I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. I just need more context. My favorite band or musical artist. Curious about the non-lawyer side of me. A. a. Ron Groban, Colton never knows any music. I'm in Asheville in North Carolina, a big music. Yeah, Asheville is a big music town. Um, it sort of depends on, I grew up on classic rock, so um, Chicago, the Eagles, REO Speedwagon, um, Elton John, Billy Joel. Um, and then as I came of age, I ended up in sort of the pop punk era, which would have been, you know, of course, I was sort of on the back end of the grunge movement. So, I, you know, I grew up knowing who Kurt Cobain and Nirvana were, and of course the Foo Fighters. Um, and then, you know, um, some, some heavier metal stuff, some skillet. I'm not a huge Metallica guy. I mean, I appreciate it for what it is. I believe that um, Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd is the greatest rock album ever. Um, and then I ended up sort of into pop punk for a while. So, you know, Reliant K. I'm sort of the, the Christian pop punk and alt, and alt rock scene for a while. Uh, my best friend of almost 20 years, known him longer than I've known my spouse. Um, he got me into it when we were when we met with it at, uh, at, at church camp when I was like 11 or 12. So I've known him for uh, over 20 years now. Um, he got me into a group called Reliant K. Uh, and then as I ended up in the athletic world, I transitioned more into hip hop. Um, so, you know, all the big names, Dre, Eminem, Snoop. Um, not a big Drake guy. I don't find a lot of value in his music. Of course, you had, you know, Biggie, you had Tupac. 
and then of course two chains and some of those folks. So I, you know, it depends sort of on my mood. If I, if I'm, if I'm working on something that's really dense, like I'm working on a legal brief from, I'm, I'm doing some really technical writing. Um, I love to put on jazz sort of a wordless, just instrumental jazz music, whether that's Kenny G or a Martini Lounge jazz group or something. I love to just play that in the background and it just sort of keeps me in, in the headspace I need to be in. But if I'm exercising or working out, I want something real heavy. I love Eminem. I love the beats to Eminem when I work out. I love the beats to, um, uh, you know, a lot of that that late 90s, early 2000s, really heavy hip hop stuff. And then, um, of course, I love country music. Garth Brooks is from is you know grew uh, was was born not too far. I, a, a family friend of ours actually went to high school with Garth Brooks. Some of some some great country music artists are from Oklahoma originally. So of course I'm I'm a, a country music fan as well. So it sort of depends on the mood. There's not a whole lot I won't listen to. Um, I love going to the Philharmonic. I, I'm sort of kind of learning to appreciate opera, like not opera, but the opera, like the story told in an opera in an opera, the the story arc of of opera. And then uh, one of the traditions I had for years was um, in December every year. Trans-Siberian Orchestra would come to you know a, a local arena and I would go see them I think I've seen them probably 10 or 12 times at this point so that was a long time tradition for me is that I would go see um, uh, Trans-Siberian Orchestra around the Christmas season so a little bit about me has a class action ever been considered I have no idea knuckles I'm sure it probably has I don't I'm not I don't know enough about class action law. I've I've done a little bit of class action defense, but it was very small scale. You know, maybe 150 people, 160 people, um, and the total damages we were looking at were maybe two or three million dollars. So not a ton of money. Um, I'm sure it's been considered, but I just don't know enough about the different avenues to secure a class action to uh, to answer that. Class actions seem really simple because we see them advertised on the news all the time. Class actions are actually very, very difficult to win. They're very difficult to prove, and they 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 uh, require an enormous amount of cash on hand to litigate the case. Even if you win and you get a huge payout, hundreds of millions of dollars, you have to have fifty or sixty or access to fifty or sixty or seventy million dollars in cash to front the cost of that lawsuit. So, there are law firms who do it, but you can I can probably count on one or two hands the number of firms that are financially in a position to take that risk. I see a super chat. We'll work our way to it. Western New York, my favorite meal. Man, I love to grill. I love to throw some chicken on the grill and take some Brussels sprouts and grill those up. Uh, cut Brussels sprouts in half and uh, sort of toast them. A little bit of olive oil, cook them up. Pretty good stuff there. Bison, let's throw this up here. Northwest Metro Atlanta. Glad to catch you live from Tushkahoma, Oklahoma. Yeah, the original headquarters of the Choctaw Nation. Yeah, very good. Let's see. You made it. Canada checking in. Yeah, I got lots of Canadians hanging out with me tonight. Forward-looking question in family law. When their kids have their own lawyer, who pays for that lawyer, and what if one party can't afford it? So um, generally, the parents split the cost of the child's lawyer. There could be court orders dictating that, you know, if, if you've got one parent who's who's a neurosurgeon, which are statistically the highest paid physicians, or a Wall Street executive, um, and the other person is a stay-at-home parent, it's very reasonable that the court would, would ask the, uh, the the high-income parent to foot the bill. But generally speaking, you, you split the cost of that. And it may not always be a 50-50 split. Um, you know, if one if one person makes seventy percent of the income and the other person makes thirty percent of the income, the court would likely um, make the legal bills be split seventy thirty, with one parent paying seventy and the other parent paying thirty, sort of like a child support arrangement. But uh, generally, the parents do. Um, and if one parent if one parent can't afford it, then they owe the law firm that money. Let's say it's a sixty forty split, and the kid has ten thousand dollars in legal bills. One parent pays six thousand, the other parent can't afford the four thousand. It means that they owe the law firm four thousand dollars. Um, it's just a contract, that's all it is. Okay, Rochester. Since I trust you, can I pay you to find me a lawyer I can trust to call you Monday? So send me an email. Um, your, your lawyer friend, Zach, is the name of my YouTube channel at gmail.com. Tell me where you're located and what your legal issue is. I will do some research. You cannot pay me for that service. It is unethical for me to accept those funds. I am not um, 
in the business of being a legal finder. I mean, those services do exist. That's just not what, what I'm employed in that capacity to do. So it would be unethical for me to charge for it. But uh, I would be more than happy to try and help you find a lawyer in your area that I think would do a good job. Um, I don't have an official way to vet them. I can sort of call and interview them and say, hey, a person reached out to me. They're looking for help in their area and, and you live, you, you practice near their area. Tell me about yourself. You know, is this, a, you know, here's the facts as I know them. And then I will put you in, I will put whoever reaches out in contact with that lawyer or that lawyer's office. And then I get out of the way and whatever happens, um, I never know. I don't want to know. I'm not privy to know. That's between you and the lawyer. So uh, your lawyer friend, Zach, at, at uh, gmail.com, send me an email and I will try and find a lawyer in your area. But uh, no, please don't, please don't pay me for that. If you want to support the channel, you can do that through the Amazon wish list, which is on my, um, which is on the description of my channel. Not this video; it will go on the video at some point. But uh, the description of the channel, uh, or a super chat, if you want to support the channel, um, there are ways to do that. But please don't pay me to help you find a lawyer. That it would be unethical for me to accept that money. Hello, Veronica. In general, what type of note can be given to someone taking a minor across state lines? Do you suggest getting it notarized? Um, so that's actually a really good question. Um, if you go back to, if you go to my channel, don't do it now. Wait till, wait till this broadcast is over. Go to my channel and if you click on videos, not the live tab, but the videos tab, there's one that I call childhood medical releases. Okay, and I talk about something called the in loco parentis release. It's Latin for standing in the feet, standing in the in the in the steps of the parent. Um, go watch that video. It's not very long. It's maybe two or three minutes. Go watch that video, and I sort of talk about that process. So that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to try and produce some more of those little two or three minute videos, sort of the high points and what you should do. Um, uh, and, I, and I sort of talk you through that. So I, I would refer you to that video. One day when I have a moderator, they'll link to it, but it's out there. The good news is I don't have a ton of content out yet, so I still have, I've probably got less than 20 videos total. So if you go to, to the, the videos, not the live, the videos, there's one called Childhood Medical Releases. I think I have a green button-down shirt uh, on in that video um, and glasses. So if you'll go to that video, um, I talk about that exact topic. So great, great question. I do appreciate that. Uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I have a family member who is originally from Louisville. I have uh, my in-laws used to live in Louisville and have friends who still live in a suburb, a couple of suburbs of Louisville. And I have flown in and out of Louisville quite a bit when I was flying airplanes for a living. Um, the individual that I flew for had uh, had a lot of business conducted in the Louisville area. So familiar enough with the airport area. Don't know a, mo a lot about the city itself um, other than it's not too far from Bowling Green, I think, where they make uh, Corvettes. And um, there's also, I believe, a Ford truck plant there. That's And then the airport. It's also uh, a UPS, the UPS uh, uh, Airlines hub, world hub. So sort of the extent of my knowledge of Louisville, but it's a cool place. It's horse country, really, really pretty out there. It's, it's a different kind of green. That Kentucky bluegrass is really a different color of green than most people have seen. Sorry, the computer's shaking. My apologies. Favorite movie? You know, this is my unpopular hot take. I don't watch a ton of movies. My wife is a movie freak. My father-in-law, my sister-in-law are huge movie people. They thousands of movies they've seen. Um, not a huge movie guy. I have a special place in my heart for um, things like um, Ten Things That I Hate About You, um, The Breakfast Club. Really, anything by the Brat Pack in the '80s. I'm a huge fan of. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, um, I have, I have a special affection for Apollo 13, which, you know, I sort of grew up with, which is really weird, I know. Um, so I, I've seen movies, not that I'm opposed to them. I'm just not a huge movie person, but for, you know, personal reasons, some of, there are a few movies that I have a special affinity for. The whole can't serve the church lawyer for DM reminds me of Tom Hagen not taking the letter from Michael that Kay had because he said in court, he said a court could use it to prove he knew where Michael was. Brian Coop, Cop, I'm sorry, Cop, I'm not terribly familiar with that situation. Eh, I believe you. I mean, it sounds like something that's absolutely what happened, and I could see a person doing that and making that argument and probably winning on that argument, but I just don't know enough about that case. Um, hi from Johnson City. Is that Johnson City, Kansas? Because if it is, if it's if it's the no, sorry, I'm thinking Johnson County, which is sort of the Olathe area suburb um, west of of Kansas City on the Kansas line, or on the Kansas side of the division, I believe. 
Lincoln Park. Okay, I see you. I was very disappointed to find out you do not do medical malpractice. Um, trying to do, trying to find a lawyer is really daunting. Yeah, so um, I don't, I can't remember if I've, if you've emailed me off the record or not. If you were in Oklahoma, I can refer you to some really good med mal attorneys. I cannot make them take your case. I can simply refer you to them to ask them if they would take your case. But my firm is the firm that I work with. Um, we do not do medical malpractice. It's one of the things we don't do. We do a wide variety of law. I think we represent over 20 states. Uh, we have the ability to represent folks in over 20 states, um, well over half the federal courts, including the United States Supreme Court and the uh, all the federal courts in the District of Columbia, so DC, a lot of states and some tribal stuff. But uh, we just don't do medical malpractice. It really takes a, a, a specialist who that's all they do and that's all they dedicate their time to. Um, it's just not something that we do. I wish I could help you out there. but. Uh, Depending on where you're from, if, if you're from Oklahoma, then I can probably put you in contact with a med mal lawyer, but outside of that, I don't know that I can be of much help to you. Who do you think killed Tupac? Oh, I don't know who killed Tupac. I believe that's, I, I know that people who are alive who do know. I know, I believe that uh, um, uh, Diddy, Sean Combs, he's been through half a dozen names, but I believe that Diddy knows because Diddy was there. Diddy ran with both of those groups, but he's uh, he's a, he's an East Coaster. Originally, if you hear him talking, you sort of hear that New York accent in his voice. Um, people know. I don't know. I you know I think Diddy was involved in. I think Biggie was involved in. He was part of the East Coast East East West rap battle in nineteen ninety in the early nineties, nineteen ninety six, ninety seven, so mid to late nineties. Um, you know, I bet all the dollars in my pocket Biggie was involved with it, which is ultimately why Biggie got got uh, got plunked as well. Top three to five questions to interview a potential attorney. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so one would be, what is your policy on communication? Some firms will send you a once a month update. Some firms send you an update every time they sneeze. And you need to figure out what's important to you. Um, I, you, know, be, I, you know, how do you bill your time? Is an email automatically point one? Is a phone call automatically point two? Some firms just have a policy that says every email we send is point one, even if it takes me 30 seconds. Um, even uh, even if it takes 30 seconds, I automatically bill it as six minutes. And that's not unethical as long as they're describing to you and making clear to you what they're doing. It's not actually unethical. Um, so, you know, get their, get their fee agreement in writing. Uh, and then ask how active are you going to be? It depends on the case. You know, if you're if criminal defendant, you're going to be very active. If it's an insurance defense dispute, you're not going to be nearly as active. And so if it's a case you want to be active in, um, some firms love for clients to be super active and some firms prefer clients to um, provide the information that's needed, the answer the questions that are needed, and then sort of let the attorney go through their process. Every firm is different. So identify three, uh, three or four things that are super important to you as the client and then ask your prospective attorneys about that um, and make sure that what the way that their practice and the way they operate meets with what your expectations are. You're interviewing for a job just like they are. If it doesn't, if it's not a good fit for you, even if they're the best attorney in the world, the, the outcome is probably not going to be what you want and you're going to be disappointed no matter how good an attorney they are just because they're, they're, um, they did not meet your expectations um, no, matter what, no matter how reasonable or unreasonable your expectations may be. Make sure you're upfront about that. So. Seems weird a lawyer can be served if they are known to be in contact with them yet some doorman. I'm assuming you actually mean can't be served. I get this question a lot, forward-looking. I, I don't. I legitimately don't know what to tell you. It's just what the law is. It doesn't have to make sense. Seventy percent of the laws in this country are arbitrary. It, it can seem weird. We don't have to like it. We do have to abide by it. That's the law. All right. I'm getting behind here. No. Yeah. Sorry, Gary. That's all I'm going to say about that. Your daughter is an oboe. It's an English horn player. Hey, there you go. All right. I see you. Here we go. Question from rural South Dakota lawyer. You lost me after the Eagles mentioned seeing them for the third time in November in St. Paul with my favorite of all time, Vince Gill. Oh, Vince Gill is a fantastic human being. I've seen him in concert twice. My dad's seen him in concert probably 10 or 12 times. Um, 
um, fantastic musician. And uh, just to, you know, his dad was a judge, actually. Vince Gill's dad was a judge who had a crush on Dolly Parton. You know, Vince Gill can play any instrument. It's got a stinking string on it. So a ton of respect to that guy. He's a fantastic songwriter. And his voice sings in a range where it can be really difficult for men to sing well in that range. And he has made an absolute killing doing that. So great. Uh, great. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Garth Brooks and Trans Siberian Orchestra. Yeah, here we go. Let's see. Here's another super chat from Tony Deck. Canadian born. Mom was American. The hard dual citizenship. Oh, had dual citizenship, but you don't, I think is what you're yeah. My adult daughter wants to move to Iowa. Do I need to get my dual social get? No. She can as long as you go through the State Department and properly relocate to the United States, um, it's absolutely do possible to do that. There's different ways you can do it on a work visa or a student visa. Um, now if you if you just for the sake of it and you feel like it would be beneficial to for your family or for your career to to seek um citizenship in the United States, absolutely go for it. But I don't think it's necessary to help your daughter um, relocate to Iowa, unless, of course, your daughter is a minor. If your daughter's of, of, of age, she's 18 or older, then you certainly don't have to do that. But you're not specifically prohibited from doing so in any way. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the super chat. Have I seen the TV show Bull? No, I haven't. So I can't tell you that accurate. Sorry. Insurance for nonprofits generally require you to call them first to tell you who to call when you discover CA or CSA as mandatory reporter. Generally, can you be held liable if you call cops first? All right. All right, Motorola Rock in 2087. I'm not picking on you here, but the way you wrote this, but with the numbers and the grammar, it's really, really hard. When you discover a CA or CSA, generally, can you be held liable if you call cops first? No, if you call the police at any point, as long as you're attempting in good faith to comply with the statutes governing mandatory reporting, I think you're okay. But I'm, I don't really understand. I'm not sure I understand your question completely. But if if you're asking what I think you're asking, as long as you report to the police, no matter the order, and and, and this is a general rule. They, your state could be very specific, but in my experience, as long as you make a good faith attempt to notify all the people, all the people you're supposed to notify as a mandatory reporter, um, you're generally going to be okay. Um, have visited Lawton several times. Um, military, maybe Fort Sill. That's probably the most common reason people visit Lawton, um, either because they're in the military or because they have loved ones in the military, um, and they're based at Fort Sill. So, um, yeah, you know, Lawton's uh, Lawton's an interesting place. It's it's got a lot of culture. There's a lot of tribal culture there. There's a lot of military culture there. A lot of fine folks in Lawton. And suits series. The attorneys always show up to serve the attorneys of the corporation they represent. Um, so that's always BS, not necessarily. Um, corporations are required, since they are not human people, they are legal persons, not human persons, they're required to have a registered agent. A lot of corporations have their attorney serve as their registered agent. I serve as the registered agent for at least one limited liability company, I actually serve for, in that capacity for more than one corporation or business. The, the registered agent is the person who is legally required to accept service of law of legal papers on behalf of the company. So suits in that to that now for, uh, first I have seen highlights I haven't actually seen an episode of suits but um, I know I know what you're talking about yeah they look up the registered agent it says Joe Bob of the firm you know Bob Jones and Company PLLC you show up and you serve you know Bob Jones the 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 lawsuit and it's deemed served that is but you cannot have a person serving as or you cannot have somebody else like an attorney serving as a registered agent for a human they can only serve as a registered agent for a corporation or a business whether that's a sole proprietorship a general partnership a limited partnership a limited liability company a corporation anything like that so that's why it's actually really easy to get service on religious technology center um some some of those entities you just look up the registered agent because they have to publish it by law you look it up you serve them okay we move on Serving a person is different. So the suits is, is accurate in that capacity.
your nephew's going to trial for murder in November. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, I don't know the facts of the case, of course, but I'm sorry that you and your family are going to be subjected to um, the stresses and the and the and the, the all those things associated with a trial. It's not pleasant for anyone. Is there any way I can find information about the charges? Can anyone attend to the court date? Can my sister, his mom, kick me out? Um, so you got lots of questions. Let's take them one at a time. Is there any way I can find information about the charges? Yes, those charges are public. In Oklahoma, we have a free website called OSCN.net. Um, so that's for the Oklahoma State Courts Network. It's where all the legal filings is the filings database. In federal court, they have PACER, which is the legal filings database. You can look them up. They are, they are public records. You can find them. They're not always free. PACER is not free. Um, OSCN is free. So different states do it different ways. Most states, it's not free. Oklahoma is unique in that. OSCN is free. Um, but you can also go to the, if you know the courthouse, if you know the, 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 the where it was filed, you can physically walk into the courthouse, go to the court clerk's office, and say, I would like to look at the court file for, you know, State versus Jones or the People versus Smith or whatever the, the name of the case is. And they can produce a copy of the, of the court file for you and you can just look at it. Yeah, it's all public. Now, there may be things that are redacted, for example, investigative techniques, the names and identities of confidential informants. Of course, you know, gr grotesque photographs of the crime scene and things and victims likely won't be in there. But at least, you know, the information, which is the charging document or the... Uh, the indictment, which is handed down by the grand jury, uh, if it, if they're charged with um, if they're charged with a case that would be subject to the death penalty, they're required to have what's called a bill of particulars, which I, I identifies the acts or omissions that they that the state believes rises uh, to the level of administering the death penalty upon a guilty conviction. Yeah, so most of that stuff, yeah, all that stuff is public record, although there may be things missing from it for um, good reason. Can anyone attend at the court? The court that yeah, it's 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 public. You show up. Um, early ahead you know before the hearing starts don't walk in in the middle of, of trial don't walk in the middle of a hearing but you show up before it starts you go through security you lawfully enter the building you go to the courthouse and you take your seat in the gallery so the courtroom is sort of divided into two sections there's either seats or benches or pews that look like pews in a church we call that the gallery that's where the public can sit and observe then there's this long rail generally with swinging doors that's called the bar. That's why, that's why you know, that's where the term bar exam comes from. You you have to pass the test to pass those doors to enter the bar. From that from that rail forward is called the bar. There's at least two tables: one for the def one for the state, one for the defense. There may be a big lectern in the middle. We call that the well. There'll be a jury box off, off to the side, and then the, the judge sits in the front with you know his or her support staff. So, um, yeah, have a seat in the gallery. Um, and uh, can your sister? Your nephew's mother kick you out? No, it's a public space. She doesn't own that space. The judge can ask you to leave, um, but generally they won't unless you give them a reason to. You're back there, you know, throwing hands or making hay or being generally disruptive and unpleasant. Then yeah, they'll ask you to leave, but the uh, sister can't. No. Do I still fly for pleasure? Yeah, I was actually going to fly today. I was at the airport before seven o'clock. Was ready to. We turned the engine on at seven o'clock, and when I was doing the uh, run up. Had a hard mag drop, so we came back and parked it. I'll have a mechanic look at it Monday. But yeah, I was actually scheduled to take uh, two flights today, one up and one back. Total time was supposed to be about two hours. It's 120, 130 miles each way, roughly. So it cut uh, what was a three-hour drive to um, basically a one-hour flight each way. But uh, had a, bag, a bad uh, magneto drop, and so if I don't have both magnetos working, I'm not going to take off because if I have an issue with my with my good magneto, I become a lawn dart. I say that in jest. Airplanes don't fall from the sky. They they, they float, but they glide as long as you're above stall speed. But yeah, yeah, I still fly for pleasure. Although I would argue every time I fly, it is it is pleasurable. I mean, I enjoy it. But yeah, I do fly um, for pleasure quite a bit. What airports have I flown into in Australia? I've never actually been down under Reefer Ricky. Now, my wife actually played basketball in Australia. Not professionally. She was there um, playing in a tournament or something. I forget exactly the context, but she's been to Australia. She loves one of her favorite places on the planet. She went to, is it called the Gold Coast or the Ivory Coast? She was in Sydney and, and stuff. I forget exactly. I don't know my geography very well down there. But yeah, she's been. She loves it. She wants to go back. I have not had the opportunity to go yet. Jackson City, Tennessee. Johnson City, Tennessee. Just saying hi to Mel. Yeah. I have no idea what's going to happen in the Gerardi case. I haven't been following it close enough to answer. Sorry. Come float the Illinois River in Tahlequah. That's right. I forgot. You do live in Tahlequah, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I have floated the – oh, first off, thanks for the super chat. Um, 
I floated the Illinois in Tahlequah uh, once or twice. Um, my mom was a graduate of Northeastern, actually. And uh, some good family friends of ours have a daughter who's uh, in Greek life at Northeastern uh, presently, actually. Good golly, Miss M. I'm not sure if it was supposed to finish in Miss Molly or not, but that's I like that uh, username there, good golly, Miss M. You have a false plagiarism claim against you, and I can't find an attorney to help clear my transcripts. Do you know someone who can help me? No, unfortunately, that has the, the first level of resolution for the plagiarism. I'm assuming you mean your academic transcripts. As somebody who is an academics, I am an acad I am an academic, and I work in academia. Um, the first way to clear the the plagiarism claim is to you need to go through if you haven't already, you need to um what they it's called exhausting the uh, administrative remedies. You have to go through the appeal process at the college or university. The academic appeal process. There is one. They are required if they're an accredited institution. They're required to have that appeal process. They're required to post that appeal process generally in either the catalog, the student handbook, or the academic policies and procedures manual. One of those three places. It's very rarely is it in the catalog, but it's always it's almost always in the student handbook and the, either the student handbook or student student code of conduct and the academic policies and procedures manual, which governs things like promotion and tenure faculty, rank and tenure considerations, things like that. Um, after that, if you've if you've already done if you haven't done that, do so. If you haven't, if you have already exhausted that, I, I legitimately don't know what the next step is. I've never actually been asked that question, so um, I hate that that happened to you. Um, you're also going to have a really hard. You might have a really hard time proving that it was your original work. Um, you're going to have to detail the research that you did, how you did it, how um, how you decided to write what you wrote. And then they will probably, the professor, the faculty member will likely be armed with what they believe to be the thing you plagiarized from. And so you need to be prepared to have evidence to refute that, that years and that you, in fact, did not plagiarize from it. And you created it yourself and uh, derived that information um, from sources that you, that you correctly cited and attributed um, to. So hate to hear that. Daughter was caught working in the States a few years ago. Will that hinder her chances? Yeah, probably. Um, if, you, if she was working here illegally, um, it's going to make it hard uh, to come back. It depends. Sometimes they're just sent back to, to their, their native country and said, don't do it again. And sometimes they're given a 10-year ban. Sometimes they're given a lifetime ban. Um, although, if she has been given a ban, theoretically, if she wants to spend the money, she can try and adjudicate that in the immigration courts. But uh, it'll be expensive if that's the route. Let's see. Um, the lifeboat. Wish she had time to stay. Good night. Hey, um, you're probably long gone because that was 10 minutes ago, but uh, have a good night. So just just so everybody knows, um, especially for you know for both my Canadians and my Americans um, who are who are hanging out with me at 84 of you, um, if you're part of the, if you're one of the 84 and you haven't liked to subscribe, do that now. Um, and also, if you go back and look, you'll see where um, on the description to the channel, and I'll add it to the description below after this video. Somebody asked yesterday, "Hey, I want to support you. Could you build an Amazon list um, of the stuff you want to improve your studio with? I want to contribute." I said, "Sure." So I did build that Amazon wish list. Um, my shipping information is already in there. So if you so feel inclined to buy something to contribute to the channel, that's great. I do not expect anybody to do that. If you do, it's a great bonus. I appreciate all the support. If you want to support the channel, you can also do that through Super Chats. But really, some of the, one of the, some of the things you can do to support the channel if spending money on YouTube isn't your thing, and I get that. Um, like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Help, the, help drive the algorithm. So um, it helps. It, it recommends the channel to people who don't independently know of the channel. And if you've got friends and you enjoy what we do here, you enjoy what I do specifically, let them know. Tell them to come hang out with us. That's all right. I, I hear you. Um, Motorella Drive, I think I answered that. Wichita Mountains, let's see, military. Nashville, Tennessee in the rain. Yeah, so good friend of mine is a songwriter in Nashville. There's you know, there's a songwriter on every corner, I know, but uh, I graduated high school with him. I think he's pretty talented, but I'm not a music exec, so hopefully he, get, he gets his big break. He's, had, he's both performed and had some of his stuff performed at uh, the Bluebird Cafe, which is kind of a big deal. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, um, a business is considered a person for many other aspects of the law. I do agree with you, but my counterpoint to that is how do you serve a building? A building can't file a legal plea. We need to tape the service papers to the side of the building and yell at the roof you've been served. A building can't intellectual property, the Coca-Cola name, can't actually prepare a pleading as opposed to a human, a person with a heartbeat can prepare a pleading. So that's that's my counterpoint to that. Hey, alone altogether, don't ever apologize that, that you can't financially contribute to the channel. I was doing this before I was monetized too. All right, don't don't ever feel guilty for a minute. Um, I, the fact that you gave up your Saturday to come hang out with me is important is, is good enough for me. Okay, don't ever feel guilty even for a second that you can't pay money to to have your question put on the screen. There may be people out there in the in the YouTube world and the interwebs that that uh, make you feel that way. That's never my intent. This should be a place where people come together to learn and exchange ideas and, and uh, engage in conversation. Essentially, I, I treat this like we're like it's a virtual cup of coffee. We're all sitting around a table drinking coffee. Okay, so don't don't ever feel guilty for a minute that you can't uh, financially support the channel. The fact that you're here, you like, subscribe, and recommend my channel um, is 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 plenty good for me. Since you enjoy flying, have you considered transporting pets for rescue? Um, I've, it's not really something that I'm so much interested in. I have helped coordinate some of those flights, and they do some great mission work. But my my energies are focused elsewhere. It's not that I'm opposed to it. I just in, I, I I invest my contributions to the aviation industry in other ways. Um, but I but I do um, I do recognize and do the, to do what little I can do to support those. I've helped arrange. You know, I've helped put pilots in contact with pet rescues and. Um, you know, I've helped, you know, FBOs or, or having to have somebody on the other end pick up the pick up the animal and take it to wherever it's going. So I have coordinated a few things like that. I don't actively fly those missions, though. But I am familiar with them. Have I flown over the Rockies in the fall? Flown to the Rockies, flown over the Rockies the fall, summer, spring, and winter. Don't love it in the winter. Actually, don't love it in the summer. I have um, density altitude issues and performance issues in the summer, icing issues in the winter. But I've crossed the Rockies both directions all four seasons. Um, I tend to, um, um, uh, I tend to uh, try. I prefer higher altitudes, so I either need a turbocharger or I need um, uh, turbine engines, like a King Air or even a jet, or I need turbochargers to get over the mountains, to get over the high mountains. I can sort of run through the low Rockies. Uh, but there's a point at which I took a naturally aspirated Baron twin engine naturally aspirated airplane out of out of uh, La Plata County, Durango, Colorado, in July. Had a density altitude of 14,000 feet, 9,000 feet of runway. It looked like it wasn't going to be long enough on paper. I had to take off and sort of circle over the airport and then fly out of the valley or fly through the valley over to uh, between Truth Truth and Consequences, New Mexico, and Tucumcari, New Mexico. There's two. There's a VOR at each one of those, and I had to split it and then turn and come back to the east. Uh, through that valley because I just didn't have the performance to climb over the mountains. I needed, I didn't have the performance or the oxygen. When I get above certain altitudes, I'm required by law to have oxygen. And I didn't have oxygen on the airplane. So, but yeah, I've crossed to go in both directions. Yeah. I uh, hate to see that good golly miss him. I, I don't know what the next step is. If you've gone through the academic appeals process, I've never actually been asked that. So, um, you might, you theoretically, if you talk to the title nine, um, the title nine representative at the university, they're required to tell you what your legal options are. They tend to be lawyers, not required to be lawyers, but they, they're, they're required to tell you what your options are, um, uh, that the, you know, uh, accreditation uh, board has approved and, um, and what the, the state and federal law allows. But after that, I don't know, I don't know what your next effort recourse would be. Let's see who's next. Hi from West Virginia. We need a name for Zach fans. How about the illegal paralegals? That's funny. And that's JLD is me. I know you had to leave us early last night. But welcome back. Let's see. Abigail sent me a super chat. You mentioned yesterday the transcript for the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial has been released. I put a link in the chat yesterday to a website where you can access the transcripts for each day. Did you see it? No, but now that you told me it's there, I will make a note to go find it. Thank you for the super chat, Abigail. I'm assuming, are you the same Abigail that's from 
upstate New York, Rochester, I believe, if memory serves. I will never remember that after this conversation, trust me. Um, thanks for the super chat. No, I did not see it, but I will make sure that I go back and retrieve that information and I will put it in my stack of things to read. Never knew the meaning of bar until I explained it. Yeah, most people don't. I wouldn't expect most people to. Uh, Gary Mackey, thanks for the super chat. And coffee sounds like a great idea. Yeah, can't ever go wrong with a cup of black coffee this late at night. I'd probably go for a cup of decaf or at least half and half. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I could drink coffee till 3 o'clock in the morning and then go sleep like a baby. But now, if I drink coffee after about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I either can't sleep or I have to go go to the bathroom all night. So, But thanks for the super chat, Gary. We'll get the... Uh, we'll get together sometime and have a virtual cup. Or as, my, as uh, some of my friends would say, some of my, my friends overseas would say a cuppa. Uh, let's see. What other questions do we have here? All right, let me see and make sure I've answered all the super chats. Yeah, uh, yeah, we talked about Tushkahoma. Yeah, we talked about that, Tony. Uh, we talked. I floated the Illinois. I mean, I'll leave yours to star to Abigail, so I make sure I go pull that transcript. It looks like I'm caught up on all of my super chats. Yeah, any of the plagiarism checkers, whether it's Turnitin or any of the others, my university just switched from one learning management system to another, so we switched plagiar uh, plagiarism checkers. Um, sometimes, and I don't know that this is what happened, but sometimes if the fa if the faculty given us if a faculty member gives an assignment, and then we make you um, you make you turn it in or safe assign or whatever the the plagiarism checker is. If we don't appropriately filter it, and the class is writing on a series of topics that are interrelated. It's checking both institutional submissions, meaning in institute um, submissions within the learning management system, as well as all the academic uh, and research journals, like the EBSCO hosts type, the EBSCO host type research in the world. Um, and so I've seen people turn in something, and there's like 85% of it claims is plagiarized. But I gave the same topic to the class, and the last paper that I grade from that assignment, if it checks against the institution, will have a high level of plagiarism identified, as opposed to the first paper assigned will have a very low level of plagiarism. I don't know that's that that's what happened in your case, but it's not unheard of that that could for time to time um, uh, change. All right. Good evening, Gypsy. Thank you for being here. Uh, I am on Instagram, but if you find one that's the Zag Morgan, that is not me. My identity got stolen a couple of years ago, and I was able to reclaim all of my social media except the Instagram page with my name on it. So I do have an Instagram page, but that ain't it. Yeah, you are from Rochester, New York, which you refer to as upstate New York tonight. Um, I did see another Rochesterian in here. I forget who it is, but I did see the two of you uh, discussing about um, Rochester. about uh, Rochester, And I know it's nowhere near upstate New York. New York City is one of my favorite places on this planet. Um, you can walk half a mile in any direction and experience an enti the entire globe. The, the culture of the entire planet. Um, I have been to upstate New York. It's been many, many years, um, but I have been to upstate New York. It was really early in my flying career. Um, and I was only there for like six or seven hours. We, we uh, started on the East Coast, sort of on the East Coast. We started in, in uh, uh, an airport outside Philly, um, flew to Islip, Long Island, and then we flew up and back to the East, um, sort of over by Buffalo. I forget the name of the airport between Buffalo and Syracuse. And then we headed back south, and we ended up spending the night down in North Carolina. That was a long day. Let's see, 68 Fahrenheit in the West Virginia mountains for JLD is me. Um, another one of my good friends from high school is originally a West Virginian. And also one of the um, most uh, tragic airplane crashes in from the 70s, really 60s, 70s era, was the crash of the West Virginia team, Southern Airways. And uh, although they have the more, and they made the movie We Are Marshall about it, but uh, it's actually hard to find the original crash site now because they have extended the runway and cleared a bunch of the trees out of the way. But if you know the exact Latin long, you can actually look it up on Google Earth and um, 
if we have anybody who flies in here, I don't know if we do or not, but essentially they run an ILS and they drop below the glide slope, fail to recover in time, and again, there's sort of a, there was a, there was a hill and then a plateau, and the airport's on this plateau. You had to clear the hill. They missed their descent point. They descended too low and crashed in the mountain instead of staying on the glide slope and clearing the hill. So Southern Airways crashed and killed the West Virginia football team. I have never been to Buffalo Niagara International. It was a general aviation reliever about 35 minutes drive time outside of there. Question, do you have to or try to protect your lecture notes and materials for intellectual property? Do you go to certain lengths to change stuff so as to not have copyright issues? Well, um, I generally use one of two texts. Since I teach primarily in the aviation field, 99% um, of my text material comes from the FAA. It's a federal government publication, therefore it's open source. There is no intellectual property, there are no copyright issues. So, the, but then the textbooks that I do use, of course, right, I cite to the author and I let them, you know, students buy them or they don't, whatever. Um, but my PowerPoints, all that kind of stuff, those are intellectual property. I make them available at my discretion. Some classes I make them available, some classes I don't. Um, I make them available to students, but my lecture material is my intellectual property. Um, and I, if you mean by protect them, like sometimes I post them, sometimes I don't. But the way I teach, I try not to hide the ball. I need students to learn this material. It is incumbent that they learn this material to operate airplanes safely in the national airspace system. So I make everything available. Um, and for most classes, there's a few classes that I withhold some stuff for a variety of reasons. Um, but generally speaking, now what I don't do is um, I don't make my PowerPoints available until after the lectures because it, it's, it's a way that I can force students to come to class. They come to class, they get the lecture notes, then I make the PowerPoints available for study. Um, and then at the end of class, or at the end of the, at the, end of the semester, they, they stay on the learning management system and then I just copy that course so they're always there. Um, but if a student wants to keep my PowerPoints or something, I don't, that doesn't bother me because I know that in two years when they get to the airlines, they're gonna need that material anyway. And if it's something that helps them be a better pilot and keep not, not just themselves safe, but my family and my friends and my colleagues safe when we travel around the country, and, my, and, my, and if my material is helpful in that capacity at all, then I feel like I have a, a, a moral obligation to the public to do that. Native Colorado in there. Um, I lived in Denver for just under a year, and the firm that I practice with of counsel, one of our brick and mortar, we have three brick and mortar offices. One of them is in downtown Denver. Um, some of the finest lawyers I've ever worked with. BC still dealing with wildfires, yeah. Yeah, an evacuation order. Anytime you see the word order, it's exactly that. It's a lawful order. If you don't follow it, it's a, it's a violation of law. And then uh, any harrowing flying stories. I have a few, but I generally don't share those outside the aviation community because for all I know of the, the you know, 78 people hanging out with us tonight, there may be somebody who's scared or nervous flying, and I don't want to cause them distress. The reality of it is, um, and I wrote my master's thesis on this many, many years ago, um, the reality of it is for every one airplane crash that kills somebody, um, over 250 million miles of road are traveled by cars. Um, it's 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 an old it's an ultra safe it's what we call an ultra safe high risk activity. Um, it's kind of like being a baby doctor. When things go really good, they go really good. When things go really bad, they go really bad, and there's not much in between. And that's true. But the reality of it is, the really bad doesn't happen very often. It is a very very safe industry. The equipment is safe. The pilots are well trained. The flight attendants are well trained. Occasionally things break, occasionally people make bad choices, but we have two pilots up front on all these airplanes, at least two pilots up front in all these airplanes. At least the ones that you're buying tickets to fly on, they're required to have two pilots. And so if one pilot's making a bad choice, there's somebody there to sort of poke him in the ear and say, hey, dummy, I need you to make a better choice. Right? Pretty simple. Um, yeah, so I do have some harrowing flying stories, but I generally don't share those outside the aviation community because there are people that I recognize are nervous flyers and they don't like they don't like flying, and I don't want to make that um, experience any worse than it needs to be because I don't have any reasonable basis to believe that any of my stories would happen to them. You know, I, it, I think it's disingenuous to do that. Just lectured your engineering students on the Gimli glider and the importance of using proper units to measure things like fuel. Yeah, you think you're taking on pounds, but in reality, you're taking on kilograms, right? And, and my favorite is, and this is true today, 
fuel trucks and fuel pumps measure fuel in gallons. I don't care how many gallons you put on my airplane. I need to know how many pounds you put on my airplane. So I have to do the conversion. And the fuel truck guy or lady has to do the conversion. And we should be comparing our notes to make sure our conversions are correct. And then the airplane doesn't actually know how much gas is in it. It only knows how much gas is in it when I tell it how much I put in it. So if I put on a certain poundage of fuel, but I don't put it in the FMS, the correct poundage, the airplane could say, you have plenty of gas, and I could fly till I'm out of gas and the engines quit. Right. The air, the, the, I will get a low fuel indicator just because the sensors are low, but then I'm going to get an issue with my flight management system telling me I'm getting erroneous information. You told me I have gas. The fuel tanks tell me they don't have gas. There's a disconnect. And then it's my job as the pilot and the flight crew to resolve that issue. So yeah, on um, the Gimli glider, right? And it happened in Canada. It was a former Canadian, Royal Canadian Air Force base. It closed, turned into a drag strip. And they took on fuel. They needed X number of X thousands of pounds of fuel. They took on X thousands of kilograms and ran out of gas long before their destination. But fortunately, one of the pilots used to be, or was retired, or former at least, Royal Canadian Air Force, knew that that airport was there and they landed even though it was a drag strip. And they refer to that as the Gimli glider because they ran the airplane out of gas. In the transport category world, that just doesn't happen. Um, wanted to be an uncivil engineer. May work on it. Yeah, yeah go do it. Yeah, see, exactly. I see Amy Green here. Thank you for not sharing the harrowing stories. It's not for everybody, guys. I mean, if, if I'm sitting across the table from you having a cup of coffee, great. I'll tell you those stories, but not not with 100 of my closest friends out here. Uh, just curious, private pilot in Canada. Hey, good for you. Grip it and rip it. Um, JDL is me. Excuse me if I say something that doesn't make sense. You're 40 minutes behind watching on double speed then I will try to speak slower so I don't sound like a chipmunk. Again, if you guys haven't, make sure you um, like, like, like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell. It does help the algorithm. Um, if you still feel inclined to support the channel, I did post the Amazon wish list. That was a request somebody made yesterday at the at last night's live stream. So um, that's on the main channel. I will also post it to the description of this video after I after we get off of here. After I get off of here with you guys, I'll post that. Um, but it's also in the main channel description and the description from last night's video, um, which was the Friday night hangout week three, I believe, was the title of that. So go check it out if you weren't here last night. Um, if you have a question that you just have a – so first off, never feel obligated to spend a nickel on this channel. Um, I enjoy doing this with you guys. You know, it is helpful. It is uh, it is beneficial when I have you know folks like you that support the channel, but don't ever feel obligated to to spend money. I know you. Um, we all have so many nickels we can spend, and we have to decide how to spend them. So don't don't ever give up something that you need to support the channel. Um, if you want to support the channel, I, I certainly appreciate it. Um, if you have a question that you just have a burning desire to answer, you can't sleep if I won't answer it. If you put in a super chat, the one promise I make is I will always answer all of my super chats. Um, it's a little slower. Last night we had a lot of chatter. I couldn't actually keep up with the questions. Uh, tonight, you, tonight, um, it's it's a little slower. No, we have about the same number of people. Just the the chat is slower. We don't have as many people talking to one another. Let's see. Hello from Germany. Um, you're surprised I'm doing live. Well, it's only nine forty here where I live. Um, and you're, let's see, you, Zulu time is plus six, which is Greenwich. And what are you, three or four hours past that? So you're going to be plus 10. So what is it, about 8 a, almost 8 a.m. there, 7.40 a.m. roughly? 0.740 if my math is right. It could be 0.640. I'm not sure if you're three or four hours plus on the Greenwich side. You may not be that far. I lose perspective I'm in, in Europe because the countries are so much smaller. Somebody said, forward-looking says, double speed, he's already that at normal speed, but amazing clarity. Yeah, so if you look on the Amazon wish list, you, you, you'll, you'll see the microphones that I put on there. Um, this is a pretty good quality headset, but it's a Bluetooth connection, and Bluetooth connections, while convenient, aren't great from an audio quality perspective. Um, and so you know, somebody said, post the wish list, so I did. The microphones that I put on there, the Shure MX-7 and the Shure SM7 Bravo are fantastic quality microphones that will bump up the audio quality another level. So um, if you have trouble understanding me, then you know that, that will help alleviate some of those problems. And I try to make a concentrated effort to speak slowly. 
you're not the first person to uh, tell me I speak fast. I once had a court reporter bore a hole in the side of my head because she couldn't transcribe my closing arguments fast enough. Keep in mind, court reporters certify at 240 words per minute with nominal errors. Um, her, she was certified at a higher level called certified real-time reporting. Those are the same people that like do closed captioning. They can literally transcribe at the rate of speech instead of having to remember it. They just transcribe at the rate of speech. Their machine, their um, st uh, stenography machine, will give them a readout of how many words per minute. And she said at 340 words, she quit. I gave, I left myself about four minutes to do 12 minutes worth of closing. So I just had to grab two more gears and talk as fast as I could put the words together. So I apologized to her after the jury was um, retired to deliberate. I walked up and I said, yeah, I'm really sorry about that. I didn't leave myself enough time. And she took it good naturedly. She laughed, but I did go up and, and apologize for uh, making her job difficult. Cause what she was, what she had to do is go back after the fact, plug headphones into the recorder and basically play it over and over and over again to make sure that she got all the closing argument properly transcribed. Simply Susan, I appreciate those kind words. Ah, Destiny Salazar is back with us tonight. Destiny, good to see you back. We've got one from New Zealand. Uh, 4.40 a.m. Okay, so you're not as far ahead as I thought you were. You would only be, so this is 21.42, so 3.7. So you're only 7, so you're really only one hour past. This is what we call Zulu time, Greenwich Mean Time, which is sort of the zero point for whether it's trains, airplanes, military, whatever, sort of the zero point is in Greenwich at the uh, atomic clock in Greenwich, GMT Greenwich Mean Time. In my industry, we call it uh, Zulu time. It's UTC, Universal Time Coordinated, because for whatever reason, they decided to actually plan it in French. So it's got the weird subject verb flip. So it would, should be Coordinated Universal Time, but in French, it would be Universal Time Coordinated. We call it Zulu time. That's our zero line. So everything, everything east is minus so many hours. Everything west is plus so many hours. So I'm, for example, in central time right now, I'm minus six. And you are... In this case, you know, um, what is plus one, essentially, because that would be, we're seven hours difference, and I'm six minus, so you're plus one, so you're only one time zone past. I'm six time zones behind. In New Zealand, yeah, we talked earlier about Australia. I had not been to Australia, but I told you that uh, my spouse went many, many years ago. She loved it, one of her favorite places. She wants to go back at some point. I figure when I'm too old and crotchety to argue with her anymore, we'll go back to Australia. You can't see her. She's sitting over here. She's sort of laughing at me. And someday, um, we, she and I have actually spoken about this. Um, someday I'll bring her on the channel, and we'll do an interview together. And I want her to, I want her to tell her story, and uh, I'll tell my story. Um, I don't describe a lot of my, my personal life on here, but... Um, you know, I have, everybody knows I have two children. I have a four-year-old and, and, and a young child. And, um, you know, we had losses before our first and, and losses between our first and second. And uh, unfortunately, when you have a miscarriage like that, people stigmatize it. And uh, that's not fair that it's stigmatized. You know, we did everything right. We followed, we did everything the doctors asked us to do. And, it, you know, for whatever reason, it was what it was. And it, it shouldn't be stigmatized. You, 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 the way you normalize something is you talk about it. And, and that way people who've had these similar issues, they don't feel alone. They don't feel isolated. They don't feel cut off. That, that they understand other people have shared experiences. Shared experiences bring us closer together. And isolating ourselves takes us further apart. And the world is far enough apart as it is. We need more reasons to come together and fewer reasons to, 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 um, to, to go opposite directions. So at some point in the future, um, she's agreed to come on the channel and and she'll tell her, she'll tell her story. Um, you know, the least favorite part of her story for me is the fact that when when we met, I'm pretty sure she wanted to ninja star me in the, in the neck until I bled out. She was not a fan of me for a very long time. Um, there's days I still don't think she's a huge fan of me, but for the most part, um, I think she's a fan. But yeah, I'll bring her on one day and uh, I'll let her tell her story. Let's see, got a little bit behind after that little. 
so you slowed down. You're catching up. You went from two times to 1.75. Ah, you're from New Jersey. Well, this isn't JLD as me. Jay Dice is from New Jersey. One of my least favorite airports in America is Teterboro, New Jersey. I can't speak as to Newark Liberty. I've never actually flown in, flown into Newark Liberty. I don't tend to fly on United. Not that I have anything against them. It's just not the airline that services the airports that gives us the, that gives the best options as far as avail flight availability for the nearest airports to me. But um, I have flown United. It's not that I'm opposed to it. Um, but you know, Newark is a big United hub. Li Newark Liberty. Um, most of the New York, the United flights servicing the New York City area fly to Newark. But Teterboro, New Jersey, is the general aviation reliever, and I think there's times where it's busier. Uh, than Newark. The controllers speak fast. They speak with heavy accents. They're not terribly patient. My first trip up there, I was a young pilot, um, not quite in over my head, but right on the edge of being in over my head and managed to just scrape by without uh, making too many people terribly angry. But uh, that was sort of a welcome to the real world moment for me because I'd sort of been flying out here out west where it's slow, lazy summer days. There's not a lot of traffic to talk to and not a lot of traffic to get vectored around outside the immediate terminal area with that sort of that five mile ring around the airport where it's super busy all the time. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of Teterboro Airport, but to their credit, I did learn a lot about how to operate in busy airspace um, after being screamed at by the uh, uh, approach controllers and then the tower controllers for the better part of 45 minutes. First time I'd ever been put in a penalty box was in Teterboro, actually. You thought I must be in a gym based on that background. No, no, this is so I have two I have two studios. My primary studio is at my normal office where my academic office is, which is at the airport because I work in the aviation department. Um, this is my secondary office, which is um, I don't have like so I don't have all my plaques and stuff and my diplomas and whatnot hung on the wall behind me in my regular office I do. The classes that we teach are not at the airport, they're on the main campus. The airport's a few miles outside of town. And so when we teach, we come in from the airport to the main campus. I live near the main campus. I live closer to campus than I do to the airport. So rather than driving all the way to the airport, I come to campus. I go into the classroom building where our classes are, and we have sort of a satellite office for the aviation faculty. It's basically a small classroom, but instead of desks, we have a conference room. We, we do have a whiteboard and overhead projector. I've got a coffee maker. We, we keep some of our materials and manipulatives and stuff in there. And so that is my, my secondary office that you see behind me. You're from New York, um, but you've been living in Norman for almost 14 years. Um, yeah, so um, when I, when my wife's first grown-up job out of college was in Norman. She worked there for about four years before she had the opportunity to advance her career. It's home to the University of Oklahoma, and... Uh, not going to say anything ugly about them, but you know I have other preferences. Gary Mackey back in the chat. I haven't seen you in a few minutes, Gary. Of all the countries that you've been to, Iceland and New Zealand are the top two. I hear a lot of people say that. Um, uh, my grandparents went to New Zealand a few years before my well, a few years before my grandfather started his final decline. Um, so I would have been in the early 20 teens, late 20 aught, something like that. Um, I would like to go to Iceland to see the Northern Lights, although that's sort of a gamble because I know people who've paid for a whole trip to Iceland and then it was overcast and they couldn't see anything. So. Um, um, Iceland has a, actually a deep aviation history. Reykjavik is has for as long as we've been flying transatlantic flights, before we had airplanes that could make the hop, really the 707 was the first to be able to do it nonstop. Um, the fueling stops were Gander, Newfoundland, Reykjavik, Iceland, and um, either Shannon or Shanwick, Ireland, depending on the, the situation. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I'm reminded, I'll, I'll tell you what I was just, what, 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 what was just told to me, but, um, and it's still actually the alternate for ETOPS, extended twin engine over water operations. They have to have alternates within so many minutes of their flight path to, um, if they were to lose an engine. And so Reykjavik is the primary alternate, air, uh, ETOPS alternate for the trans, what's called the Great Northern Route, which is the busiest international corridor in the world. And that's sort of 
the United States and Northeast Canada to um, mainland Europe, whether it's, well, mainland and in, in even the UK. It's called the Great Northern Route. It's the busiest route in, uh, in the world. Sure, uh, international routing in the world, actually. Um, and then during World War II, when they were flying B-17s to Europe, they couldn't make the hop nonstop, of course. So Reykjavik, I mean, uh, yeah, Reykjavik was a refueling point. And then Keflavik, the military base at Keflavik is a NATO base that allows um, uh, NATO-friendly countries to stop and do refueling, offload and reload. And so it's um, Iceland has been a great partner to both the, the Europe, uh, the ma mainland Europe, uh, as, as well as the UK, and then um, uh, the re and then the the North American representatives to NATO for a long time, which reminds me, after having been reminded, um, if you haven't seen the play Come From Away, it's fantastic. It was the first Canadian play to both be nominated for and win multiple Tonys. It tells the story of Gander, Newfoundland, um, on and in the days immediately after September 11th, 2001. The entire cast is 12 characters. All 12 characters play multiple characters, all 12 actors play, or I guess the cast is 12 actors. All 12 actors play multiple characters, and it tells the story of how the community of Gander, which is just under 10,000 people, came together to support in a, basically a doubling of the size of the town um, uh, because the U.S., the United States had shut down international arrivals and departures. And so if you were headed from the U.S. to a foreign country, you couldn't turn around and come back. And if you were headed from a foreign country to the U.S., you couldn't turn around and go back because you were past, like there's a point at which you can't turn around and go back. You don't have the fuel. The airport that services that is Gander. And so um, it's a fantastic um, musical, actually. It was nominated for one a bunch of Tonys. I know we got a bunch of Canadians in the chat tonight. So um, you guys you guys stepped up uh, when it was necessary. And I know that um, a lot of us here in the States, especially in the aviation industry, appreciate uh, what you guys did in that time. Yeah, I see you, Jay Dice, coming from a Catholic family. When are you going to have kids? Yeah, I, I hate that. I hate that question. Yeah, you know, when I was when I was young and naive, I asked that to people not knowing uh, the realities of the situation. And then after I educated myself, I reached out to really it was one person in particular, former flight instructor of mine, reached out to him and apologized. Said I didn't realize um, how insensitive what I said was, and his response was, as mine has been to other people as well. Dude, you had no way to know. He had no way of knowing what our struggles were, but that doesn't make it okay. It at least makes it defendable, I guess, but it certainly doesn't make it okay. If Mark and Claire want to have me on their live stream, I would love to. Um, and I'm sure Aaron could hook me up with them, but uh, I don't know them as well as I know um, Aaron. But if that's something you guys want me to do, let Mark and Claire know. I'll get with Aaron and see. If Mark and Claire want to have me on, I certainly I want to go on with their permission. I don't want to invite myself onto their 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 broadcast. I believe that to be uncouth. But if they're interested in having me on, I would more than happy to uh, to to, uh, to to talk with Mark and Claire. Um, in fact, my, I think my very first live stream that I did, uh, one of my very first, I think my well, no, is very my welcome to my channel video. I talk about uh, Mark and Claire uh, Headley and blown for good. Yeah. Make sure you go go see them. All right, I see we're we're at over a hundred viewers right now, which is fantastic. Guys, do me a favor if you haven't already, please like and subscribe below and hit the little notification icon. And I, I hate asking for that, but that's the reality of how how this works. I know you guys have a lot to pick from on a Saturday night, and spending it with me uh, means a lot to me. Uh, so if you would like and subscribe, hit that bell that the bell icon to get the notification. It does help the algorithm. Um, if there's a question that's just absolutely burning and you just can't sleep until you know the answer, I'm sending a super chat. I'll put it on the screen. I'll answer it. That's the promise that I make. If you give me a super chat, I promise to answer your question and, and uh, throw it on the screen. Um, and then uh, I did have a request yesterday. So some of you've heard this, but did have a request yesterday. So I did publish an Amazon wish list to help in, uh, increase the uh, the, the uh, presentation quality, increased audio, increased video, uh, increased lighting. So. And I've got it. I'm going to configure it in a, in a fairly mobile manner so that I can sort of take the major components of it with me everywhere I go. So if I'm you know traveling for business or something, I can still jump on and do do videos with you guys. So, um, not from New Jersey. Kids born in Queens and forever a New Yorker. 
JLD, I see you catching up from earlier. Do not enter the well. Never enter the well. That's true. Never walk through the never walk through the bar rail unless you're invited, unless you're an attorney on the case. Forward looking skydived. I was asked to throw skydivers a time or two, but I didn't trust the airplanes. They took I felt like they took better care of the humans in the airplanes. And not that I'm opposed to that, but I'm the one flying the airplane. And although the pilots are required to wear parachutes, I don't have an interest in skydiving. I would rather bring the airplane back with me than have to leave the airplane behind. Do you have a Twitter? So I do have a Twitter. You can find me just by searching my name on Twitter. Um, I don't tweet much. I think it's or X, whatever it's called now. It's not my platform of choice. Um, I, I probably should spend more time being on that platform because it does allow uh, more instantaneous access to my subscriber base. But um, I think the last tweet was probably a live tweet from a college football game I was watching or something. It probably sounds like my last tweet, if I recall correctly. Um, and it's probably two or three years old. To be honest, the primary reason I have all the social media platforms is when I was doing insurance defense, I would need to investigate people that I would see pop up in evidence, you know, in discovery or witnesses in the case. And so I had um, social media accounts for all the major social media social media platforms so that I could look people up um, to see if I could if I need to send them a subpoena or they have you know, is there evidence they posted on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram that I need to get for my case file or something. Northern BC just sounds cold like 10 months out of the year. Um, you, you do get to see a lot of the northern lights, and I think that's probably your reward for living um, that far north. Should be your reward at least. See, we got a bunch of cat not a bunch, we got several Catholics in here. My mom was raised Catholic, my grandmother's Catholic. My parents' wedding is recognized by the Catholic Church, and is, as is my birth, but uh, I myself am not Catholic. I am a person of faith. I'm a member, proud member, have been a lifetime member of the United Methodist Church. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you who are familiar with, with, with what's happening in the Methodist Church, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a biblical expert. My wife, um, one of the many, many, many things she's better at than I am is, is biblical knowledge. She's sort of my go-to in terms of biblical knowledge, but... Uh, as far as uh, schismatically, what's happening in Methodist Church, it makes my soul hurt. Not just for those who stay and for those who leave, but also those who are sort of crossfire, sort of cannon fodder in the process of disaffiliation. Um, anytime a church casts a vote to disaffiliate, whether they end up disaffiliating or not, um, it, it leads to it leads to hurt souls and, and broken spirits, and ultimately people leave the church no matter the outcome of the vote. And I hate to see that. Um, not just for the life of the church, but also for the spiritual life of those affected by it as well. So, you know, um, you know, this too will pass. The, the the greater church, the greater purpose of the church will survive no matter what branding we put on the outside and no matter what um, dogmatic teachings we tend to follow and no matter how we view the sacraments or what sacraments we recognize, the, the greater good um, of the of the intended purpose of the church will prevail. Yeah, so um, Diana Walsh, not sure when you jumped in, will my wife ever come on to say hi to my virtual friends? Yeah, we, uh, we talked about this earlier. My wife will, uh, she and I have talked. At some point in the future, she will join me for, um, for a, I don't know if we're going to do it as a recorded and I'm going to edit it or if we're going to do it as a live. That'll sort of be up to her. Um, and she's going to tell her story. I've sort of already told you part of my story, but she'll tell her story. Um, and if we do it as a, as a recorded, if she's interested in doing a live so that she can come back at some point and answer specific questions, then we may look at that. But uh, I'm going to leave it up to her and her timeline uh, on when she decides she wants to do it. Um, that's it, It's her story to tell, not mine. And so um, she'll tell it when she's ready. Um, and she knows that. I don't have to ask her, are you going to come on my channel? We've already talked about it. And when she's ready, she'll say, all right, let's do it. And at that point, we'll, uh, we'll get it scheduled. But yeah, someone should come on and say hi to you. 
it's not that she's hiding. You just can't. I don't, just don't have a bite enough camera. She's sitting over there eating nectarine. She loves fresh fruit. Um, she makes better life choices than I do. I love. Uh, I love uh, uh, boneless chicken wings. She loves fresh fruit. That's sort of the, the difference in our decision making for the most part. You know, she doesn't drink black coffee. Um, uh, she's 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 generally a good person. And has been for most of her life. When she met me, I was not a kind of person. That's why I try to sign off all the time with, do me a favor, be kind to someone. Because it is important to be kind to people. I was not always a kind person. When she met me, I was pretty arrogant. Um, it's, it's, it's one thing to be arrogant. It's different to be arrogant and back it up. I couldn't back it up. You can't see her. She's laughing right now. Hey, Lifeboat, you're still there. Um, yeah, if there's something specifically that specific you want to email me, my YouTube email is your lawyer friend Zach, just like the name of my YouTube channel, your lawyer friend Zach, uh, at gmail.com. Send that to me at my YouTube email. And if there's something specific that I can help you with, I will give you an alternative means to contact me. But for people who contact me through YouTube, that's sort of my clearinghouse to determine those that I can, that do need help that I can provide or, you know, spam and scam and whatever else. So I sort of use that as a clearinghouse to filter all that out so I don't load up my, the rest of my email inboxes with, uh, uh, with information that could be better handled through another avenue. Um, Let's see. Oh, I have a super chat down here from Paula Puffer. Never jump out of a perfectly good airplane, Paula Puffer says. Paula, I agree with you, but I would also um, note that skydive airplanes are very rarely perfectly good. Most of them are held together by duct tape, balin wire, and a cotter key. Because uh, reality is you never leave the airport environment. You basically make climbing left turns to 10,000 feet, get into slow flight, put some flaps down, get the airplane as slow as you can safely fl fly it, but leave yourself a little margin of error. Um, wish them the best of luck. And then um, perfectly irrational humans strapped to a uh, sleeping bag, held onto their back by um, parachute cord, jump out of a rickety airplane, and then uh, you pull the, the pilot retracts the flaps, pulls the power to idle, pushes the nose over, accelerates the red line, and tries to race him to the runway. First one there wins. Would you ever consider making YouTubes from the cockpit on your flights? You are not going to like my answer. No, but that is not coming from the pilot perspective. That is coming from the lawyer perspective. If I shoot a YouTube video in an airplane and something happens, during that flight that requires an NTSB report be filed or an NTSB notification occur. Even if I never publish the YouTube video, the video exists and is subject to discovery when the FAA investigates and tries to violate me or anybody else on that flight. Now, that's not, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I, under certain restrictions and limitations, I would look at it. Had my flight gone today, I had already come up with some stuff that I was going to shoot for some YouTube shorts to try and, try and pull some more traffic. Um, but I don't know that I would ever... First off, 99% of flying isn't sexy. It's not pretty. Like the takeoff, the initial climb, and the descent landing phase are the exciting parts. The rest of it is just making sure you push buttons in the appropriate sequence that the airplane is going the correct direction at the, at the correct speed and will arrive at roughly the appropriate time. That's literally 99% of my job when I'm flying. I was always curious about international waters and the law there, especially with serious crimes like murder on the love boat. So um, international waters are governed, just like international airspace, are governed by international treaty. And not all countries are signatories to the treaties and agreements, but those countries who are signatories to the treaties and agreements, there are there is recourse, there is maritime law and stuff. So. Um, not to be confused with the maritime law, the sovereign citizen movement sort of makes up. That's not actually a thing, just as, as a heads up. We'll spend a few more minutes. It's getting a little bit late, but uh, we'll spend a few more minutes and we'll wrap it up. So if you have a question that's absolutely burning that you're not going to be able to sleep if I don't answer, make sure you throw it up as a super chat so I guarantee I get to it. Uh, chat should be by subject. Subject matter, it may be better. I don't know, just a suggestion. Hey, 
I'm open to subject. I'm open to suggestions. Eventually, I have a moderator who can filter some of this stuff for me. I've had a couple of folks reach out to me. I'm, I'm vetting them at the moment, but it's 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 a little bit hard to want to hand over moderator authority to somebody that I've only that I only know through emails and through the chat. You know, there's a couple of them on the SPTV network who do a lot of moderating, um, and then I've had some other some other subscribers reach out as well. Um, so we'll see. At some point, I will have a moderator to help organize and bookmark and do some of this stuff for me. But uh, and until last night, and even last night, it was only one very brief issue that the individual did not know about. And then after he was informed, um, he, it self-resolved. Uh, and that is essentially no politics on the channel. So um, once once it was brought to his attention, he asked me a half a dozen more questions throughout the night and got them all answered. None of them were political. So yeah, that's my one rule: no politics. I may decide to start a political channel at some point, but that's not what I intend for uh, this platform. So, Anthalia, I believe you're the German. Um, how did I meet Aaron? So this is I'm actually getting this question fairly often. I was off, I was asked twice last night. You're the I believe the third person to ask me today. Um, way back in the summer of 2022, Aaron was putting out videos on his channel. He hadn't quite reached. He hadn't. He was about 95,000 subscribers at the time, and he was gearing up to cover the Danny Masterson um, SA trial in LA, that started in like late October, early November. And as you get closer to trial, a bunch of pleadings get filed, you know, motions in limine, subpoenas, motions to restrict limit strike, motions in limine, things like that. Um, and so he had a bunch of questions about it, was doing a video about it. He said, I just quite frankly don't know what this means. I grew up, you know, so you know, you know his line, right? I grew up in a cult. I don't know. So if you do know, reach out. So I reached out to him and uh, said, hey, I don't want to go on the record, but I may be able to give you some help of just navigating the legal um, process. You know what what these terms mean, how they work, what to expect, um, and I just sort of provided some deep deep background for information for him, and never went on his channel. And he never disclosed my identity, um, and I did that for several weeks until he and I had established a relationship. And I've watched the material that he was putting out based on the information that I gave him, and realized that he was accurately reflecting what I had told him. He was correctly identifying those areas that I did not have information on. He wasn't speaking out of turn. He wasn't putting words in my mouth. And then I, and I discovered that we both have a common goal, and that is simply to make the world a kinder place. Um, and, you know, we have different ways we go about it, but we share a common goal. And when I realized that he was, he was legit, he wasn't a shyster or something, um, he, you know, he reached out and said, hey, would you be willing to go on my channel as an expert? And at that point, I said, yeah. And so I was an expert and sort of a legal consultant for him um, at no charge through the first Danny Masterson trial and the second Danny Masterson trial. The first one uh, hung, and then they had the second one in um, April or May, I believe, and the jury came back on that before June. And uh, a lot of his followers, and that's many of you on here, suggested at the time, hey, you should start, Zach, you should start your own YouTube channel. I would watch that. So Aaron one day said, hey, you should start a YouTube channel. So I thought about it, and okay, well, I started one. It took me a while to get some content up, and then I got some content up, and I got good feedback so i put a little more up and then decided hey let's let's do some live and, and answer some questions in real time instead of putting out a video and then sort of addressing the issues in the comments because some of these answers are long-winded and i don't want to punch my thumbs that many times on my on my cell phone so um and the rest as uh paul harvey would say uh now you know the rest of the story paul harvey uh, the late paul harvey now a fellow oklahoman himself let's see um Question, when is something going to be done with McCurtain, Pushmataha, and other, other corrupt counties there? Yeah, I don't know. Um, nothing's going to be done until the voters vote for people who are not corrupt. It's that simple. When you see in the newspaper all those people, and I know what you're talking about in the news article in um, either McCurtain or Pushmataha County, um, everybody who was subject to that video was an elected official. Two county commissioners and the county sheriff. All of those are elected officials. In Oklahoma, we elect everybody but the preacher, and in some churches, they elect the preacher. Okay, we elect everything from the dog catcher to the president. A lot of other states aren't like that. If you're sick of the way it's happening, then you need to get active. Vote for somebody different, or better yet, put your name in the ring and run for office and try to change it from the inside out. If enough people go to the polling place, things change. 
We've seen that at the end of presidential elections. We've seen that at the end of gov at the end of you know governor elections. California did it when they recalled Governor Jerry Brown and elected Arnold Schwarzenegger during the energy crisis in 2005 or six, whenever that was. So I'm not talking the politics of it. If you're unhappy with the way it's happening, either find you know recruit somebody that you like and will represent your interests to run for office, and then get out and help and help them campaign and raise money and put signs up and get votes, or do it yourself. I mean, from a legal perspective. You elect the DA, you elect the sheriff, you elect the county commissioners, and you elect the judges. And I'm not saying the DA and the judges are corrupt. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if you if you're if you're concerned that there are levels of corruption, all of that all of those levels are coming from people whose job you hire. You hire them for that job as a voter. If you're dissatisfied with their performance, run for office. Okay, you don't have to know how to run a back or to be a county commissioner. You need to know how to run a business, how to balance a budget, how to prioritize projects. That's how you become a good county commissioner. A good county commissioner doesn't need to know how to build a bridge. They will hire bridge builders. They don't need to know how to dig ditches. They'll be, they'll hire ditch diggers. They don't need to know how to lay asphalt. They'll hire asphalt layers. A good county commissioner needs to know how to negotiate budgets, how to prioritize projects, how to take the ideas of the public and, and, and figure out a way to, to roll out and implement those good ideas, how to be good um, stewards of, of taxpayer dollars, you know, how to, how to give the maximum benefit for the dollar, how to stretch the dollar as far as it'll stretch. Okay, so, um, same thing with, with, the, with the county sheriff. Just because you pull somebody over doesn't mean they need a ticket, but it doesn't mean everybody gets warnings either. It's developing um, departmental policies regarding discretion. You know, treating people who are arrested and placed in handcuffs and taken to the county jail with dignity. Uh, just remember, everybody sitting in a county jail, 99% of them at least, have never been convicted of a crime. Just because you're in jail doesn't mean you did it. It means they had probable cause to arrest you. But even if you did do it, you're still a human and you still have an inherent right to be treated with dignity. No matter how bad what you did was, you have an inherent right to be treated with dignity. And the sheriffs of Oklahoma, the county sheriff in Oklahoma only has one constitutional charge. Maintain the jail and provide courthouse security. That's it. Enforcing the speeding laws and serving search warrants and you know having a, a SWAT team to go in and execute you know felony warrants. Those are all things that they can do. But they don't have to. The one thing they have to do is they have to maintain the jail and provide courthouse security. That's their only constitutional charge. That's it. And so if you are legitimately unhappy with one or more of those positions, find a way to get involved in politics at the local level and, and, and see if you can solve it. I mean, that's the, the best answer is if you're, if you're dissatisfied with, with, the, with, the, with the present status, make a change to the status quo. So if you decide to throw your hat in, good luck to you. Let's see. Um, Christian B has a super chat been listening had just half asleep and not very active that's okay you don't have to be active in the chat the fact that you stopped by at all is important to me another long work week just wanted to say you're awesome Christian I appreciate that um, I appreciate the super chat and if you have a question uh, throw, it, throw it in this throw it up there I'll put it up Destiny Salazar I believe you're one of the favorites in the chat this evening um, let's see So JLD is me says, I'd love to skydive, but I don't think you can do it in a wheelchair. Here you go. While you can't do it in a wheelchair, they do offer what are called tandem jumps, where you will be securely uh, fastened into a harness, and then that harness is physically attached to an experienced skydiving instructor. And I guarantee you that every skydiving instructor who does tandem jumps has jumped with somebody who has some sort of physical impairment or disability, including being confined to a wheelchair. So don't give up on it. Just because you're wheelchair bound doesn't inherently mean you can't skydive. There are they they can get you onto the airplane, which is probably the single hardest part is is getting you into the airplane, um, because everybody in a skydive airplane sits until they get to altitude anyway. So it's not like you're standing up, running up and down the aisles like on an airline jet or something. You're crammed in the back of a 182 that has all the seats but one ripped out. Everybody's just sitting on their butt on bare aluminum. Okay. And then they get you in the airplane, they take you up, they hook you into the harness. Getting out of the airplane is really quite easy. Gravity does all the work. You get to the edge and then let go and gravity does all the work. That's the good part. The energy necessary to skydive is free. 
It's gravity. So if you have a desire to skydive, um, do some Google searching, find skydive facilities and skydive schools near you and explain your situation. Say, I want to experience skydiving, but I have certain physical limitations, including the fact that I'm wheelchair bound. Are you able to accommodate that? And they should. They should want to accommodate that. That would be a fantastic marketing opportunity for them. Hey, look at all these things. We can help people who struggle to live in the world. Um, when we're falling, when we're in free fall, and we're falling at terminal velocity, everybody's equal. Whether you're able-bodied or you're in a wheelchair, it doesn't matter. You're not walking up there anyway. So, yeah, don't give up on it. Contact a local skydive school near you and see if they can accommodate you. Yeah. The, the, the worst they're going to say is no, but I would, I would be willing to bet somebody in your area who operates a skydive facility is able to accommodate whatever disability you may have. So don't give up on it. Go chase it. Oh, if I'd have read a little bit further, never mind. I just Googled it. Apparently, you can skydive in a wheelchair. Yes. So never mind. <laughs> You've already answered it. Mile High Hokey. I'm really hoping that means you are originally from Virginia, but living in Colorado. I'm hoping is what your username means. Enjoying the live chat, Zach. Have to ask, Broncos, Chiefs, or Cowboys? So I can actually answer that with two teams because Broncos and Chiefs are AFC. Cowboys are NFC, so I'm allowed to like both. So, mm, no, um, I'm a Cowboys fan in the NFC. And um, I, so I became a Broncos fan when Peyton Manning went to the Broncos because I'm a Peyton Manning fan. And I've got family in Colorado, and I lived in Denver for a while, so I, I appreciate the Broncos. But I grew up a Kansas City Chiefs fan because they were the closest AFC, AFC team to us where I grew up. So, you know, if, as long as they're not all three playing each other at the same time, I can generally pick a team out of that. But uh, when the Broncos and the Chiefs play together, I just want I want uh, Patty Mahomes to play well, and I don't want the Broncos to embarrass themselves. But uh, hopefully Sean Payton being hired as the Broncos head coach will help turn their, their uh, fortunes around. I'm asked when they, well, what about the Super Bowl when they play each other? Well, it'd either be Broncos, Cowboys, or Chiefs, Cowboys, because, of course, the Broncos and Chiefs can't play each other. They're both AFC, but they could face each other in the AFC championship game. So hopefully Sean Payton can turn them around. Um, I was not a Sean Payton fan when he was in New Orleans, but then I started researching him, and he's actually a little a little better guy than I gave him credit for, I think. So hopefully he's able to turn it around. Um, Broncos fans are great fans. They deserve to have a quality team on the field. Thanks for the Super Chat. Mile high, Hokie. Uh, Paula Puffer, super chat, oh no to the skydiving, hard nope, 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 she says. Nothing wrong with that, it's not everybody's cup of tea. And I will tell you too that just because you're a great flyer doesn't mean you're a great skydiver and people who enjoy skydiving, I know a lot of people who love to skydive, but they hate flying in the airplane to get there. You know, not, nothing in the world wrong with, uh, nothing in the world wrong with it. JLD is me says, you want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? A friend of yours did it when she was 70. Yeah, um, the late President Bush, Bush the first, he, I think he celebrated his 90th birthday with a skydive. Yeah, you're never too old or too young. Eh, you can be too young. I'm not going to throw my 12-week-old on out of an airplane. But um, generally speaking, you're never too old to, to, to skydive. As long as your heart is healthy enough to withstand the stress, yeah, give it a shot. Would you fly a micro light without a parachute? I weigh way too much to fly a micro to fly a micro light. I'm sitting, I'm sitting on the couch right now, 300 pounds. I'm not going to fly anything that doesn't have like an aluminum an, an aluminum um, body surrounded by support spars with a semi monocoque um, aluminum uh, uh, rail to the to the tail. So uh, no, just because I can fly something doesn't mean I will. <laughs> That's one of those things that I won't. Awakened by the looking glass reflection. Wasn't able to catch it tonight, but hope you uh, but wanted to stop in and say hello. Hope all is well. Hi. So when you see this later, hi. Yeah. Yeah. Love listening to Paul Harvey as a kid. Yeah. Um. There, I, there was um, something about his voice that was relaxing. Just the way he had a voice for radio. Just the way he presented himself on the radio. It was really hard to dislike him. Even if he was touting a conspiracy theory, at least he sounded good doing it, right? Zach for public office someday. Yeah, you know, Tony, I appreciate the support, but I'll be honest. I grew up in a family of politicians. My grandfather served in office. My father served in office. I almost ran for office, but I know the toll it takes on a family, even if you win. And I also know the, to the toll it takes on a family when you lose. 
And it's not that I don't have support. My wife looked at me and said, if you want to run for office, let's go. Let's do it. If you're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And I'm going to stand beside you the whole way. Um, there are other ways I feel like I can contribute other than running for office. And I was also offered a job in, in policy in D.C. right after I got out of law school. Um, I would have loved to have taken the job, but it wasn't the right time in my life. And I think it's hard to, to be doing that job in your 40s. That is really a young person's career. You're tired of that by the time you're 30. You're running 20-hour days, living on black coffee and cold pizza. It's really, really unhealthy. And as I, I think I mentioned this last night on the broadcast, your best day, you win one battle in 30. Your worst day, you lose every argument you have. I mean, your best day is 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 an, is nominal progress towards a means to an end. So, uh, while I appreciate the support, I've considered public office, and I think there's other ways I can contribute. Um, and it's not that I'm scared of losing. I'm an athlete. Losing comes with everything that you do. I've lost jury. I've lost jury trials, and I've won jury trials. I've lost motions, and I've won motions. I mean, it happens. It's not that I'm scared of losing. It's that I feel like my resources and my time and my energies and skills are better spent um, advocating in a different capacity. Let's see. Sorry, you're right. It wasn't Jerry Brown. It was Gray Davis, dastardly saboteur. Yes, sorry. I said Governor Jerry Brown. is actually uh, Governor Gray Davis. Thank you for that. I, I, did, I did get that one wrong. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, Anthalia says, Anthalia, we don't elect the prosecutors in the EU, and I like that. Most people don't know the law. So... All right. Um, there's a couple of things here. Um, while we do elect prosecutors and, and uh, well, it, it depends. At the federal level, we do not elect prosecutors. The attorney general is the chief prosecutor of the United States. He is appointed by the president. And then um, the official United States attorneys for the various federal districts are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. The assistant um, U.S. attorneys are just hired attorneys. They're just employees of the government. Um, at the state level, most states elect their prosecutor. They elect their attorney general and they elect their local prosecutor, whether they call it the state attorney or they call it the district attorney or they call it the county attorney or they call it whatever, the county prosecutor, whatever. Um, or I think in South Carolina, they call it the county solicitor or whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, but in order to serve in those elected positions, you have to be an attorney. So inherently, you have to know at least a minimum amount of law or you wouldn't have passed the bar exam. So it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. Um, although you do, I will acknowledge, you have a much different system um, in the EU, in the whole of Europe, really, even the non-EU countries. Uh, let's see. All right, right, let's. I'm going to wind it down here. Um, I'm at 1016, so don't. Th if you got a super chat, throw it up. I'll get it answered. Otherwise, I'm just going to sort of speed scroll through here. I'm tired. It's been a long day. I was up at I was up at uh, about 5.45 local time. So I've been up 18 hours now. Going on 20. Yeah, Rocky Mountain, Colorado. Yeah, yeah. You call them a flying squirrel suit. I think the technical term is a wing suit, but yeah. Um, you can you can fly for miles in those, and because of the the ram air inlets, they become a, they become a semi rigid wing, um, and they keep your body in a horizontal position. So you it really is fairly aerodynamic. It's much more aer aerodynamic than even a lot of airplanes. You don't have these big engine nacelles and landing gear and whatnot hanging out in the wind. So yeah, let's see. Virginia Tech. Okay, one more. Here we go. Super chat from Destiny Salazar. Zach Pack, and you think it's a lock. So we sort of had two trends for the Zach fan club. It was uh, the illegal paralegals and apparently the Zach Pack. So. Whatever you guys go with is fine by me. Whatever you decide, if you can reach a consensus, let me know. I'll try to set up a merch store or something that's got the logo. I'll come up with the logo. I'm not terribly creative, but fortunately, I'm married to somebody who's creative. And uh, I'm sure we could come up with some sort of logo to throw on some swag, put on the merch, merch store, let you guys have at it. And then your job is to find me in real life. 
right? Yeah, if I pass you, if you have uh, a Zach Pack or an illegal paralegal shirt on, and I walk past you and you don't say something, I think you lose the right to wear your your uh, your swag. So your job is going to be to find me in real life. Time to get on Zwift. Been avoiding it long enough. Yeah, get on the bike, get on the trainer. I know it sucks, but it's better than riding 105. Get on the trainer, do your job. I hear you. Good luck to you. Let's see one more. Here's a super chat. Yeah, Christine, Christian B. I believe I may have called you Christina earlier. I'm not sure, but in any way, I think it's the if you're the same Christian B I talked to you last time who works on the, the hydro lines. It's at least the second time I've referred to as you a girl. It's not personal. Apparently, I don't read as good as I thought I did. And if you've ever heard me speak, you also know the irony in what I just said as well. But I'll leave it up to you to decipher. All right. It looks like I'm caught up now. 1025. Jadai says Zach Pack. Yeah, yes. All right. I think I got to all the super chats. Let me double check. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Got to that one. Got to that one. And I got to that one. Very good, ladies and, and guys. I appreciate all of you coming out tonight. I'm going to shut her down. Um, appreciate each and every one of you coming out. Uh, if you if you didn't catch the whole thing, it'll be up for replay in just a few minutes. So uh, turn it on, put your earbuds in, and uh, do what you got to do. Appreciate each and every one of you coming out. We'll try to do it again. All right. Uh, I know you got a lot of choices on Saturday night. I appreciate you picking me. And uh, do me a favor. Be kind to somebody. We'll talk to you soon.